start, Nancy. Okay, thank you, Kim, and uh, welcome everybody. So, welcome to every all our new members and all our returning members. Um, and I hope you'll enjoy this June meeting of the Durham Region Branch. Here's our agenda for the evening. Uh, they'll have, I'll have some announcements and news. Then we will have our feature presentation with Megs Galden, uh, followed by a very short video about our library and research room. We'll get to upcoming meetings and hopefully we'll even have a little bit of time at the end that we can actually open up the microphones and uh, and or the chat window and, and uh, have a little bit of a get to know each other time. So I, I'm really pleased to announce our grand reopening of our research room and library. Uh, it's, it's hosted at the Northminster United Church here in Oshawa, corner of Simcoe and Ritson Street, or Simcoe and Rosslyn Streets. And we're going to start with the second and third Fridays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. But we're going to say that it's by appointment only, and we're going to right now limit it to two people in the room. Uh, we chose Fridays because um, that's the day of the week, the parking lot is the least busy. Uh, Stephen Wood is our research uh, person. And uh, if you shoot him an email at durhamresearch at ogs.on.ca, he can book you in. So we will be re reassessing this over the summer. Uh, and any changes will be noted on our website, Facebook group and blog. And kind of hand in hand with that, we had our inaugural virtual library drop in last month and it went really, really well. We were so pleased with the attendance. And we have now received a Zoom registration link that is valid from June to November. And this link will allow you to register for one, a few, or all of the sessions. So our monthly drop-ins will take place on the fourth Thursday of each month at 11 a.m. And uh, so I'm just saying, grab a cup of coffee and bring your questions. June 23rd is the next one. Any Durham Region questions, any general genealogy questions. Um, if you think we might have a book and you want to look up, you can ask for that too. And the link for that uh, will be up on our website, blog, and Facebook group in a few days. On the local level, the Lakeshore Genealogical Society is um, based, who is based in Coburg. Uh, they're holding a drop-in afternoon on Saturday, June 11th at the Coburg Public Library in one of the meeting rooms there. And they're offering your help for your Northumberland County families. So um, they've been very receptive to uh, inviting us and um, we really appreciate it. And we've got new publications. Well, new old publications, old publications that are turned vi virtual digital. So we have three church record publications um, that have been placed in the Ontario Ancestors Marketplace area. And we had to create a new uh, category for them. So it shows up first before all the township uh, categories and it's church records. And this is what it looks like. Uh, the first one, Durham Region United Churches, uh, contains uh, baptisms, marriages, and burials for uh, congregations that eventually formed into the United Church of Canada. Um, they are the ones that uh, are in Durham Region. I have to admit, burials are pretty sparse. There's only a couple of those um, churches involved but there's quite a few baptism and marriage records there. Now, the other two publications we've had around for quite a while, uh, they are baptismal records uh, from the Wesleyan Methodist um, uh, circuit 
preachers, uh, basically 19th century, and they are churches in the old Durham County and the, well, I should say historic, historic Durham County and historic Ontario County. Um, for those who don't know, Durham Region is composed of old Ontario County minus Rama and Mara townships and three out of the six townships from the old Durham County. Those three townships are Cartwright, which is now part of Skugog Municipality, and Clark and Darlington townships, which are now combined as Clarington Municipality. So these, but these baptismal publications actually cover the complete county. So we have a complete Durham County one and a complete Ontario County one. And we also have a new publication that groups five small cemeteries of Darlington Township together in one publication. And that includes Arnold Pioneer Cemetery, the Emily Moore Stone, Rehoboth Cemetery, Salem Cemetery, and the St. John's Anglican Churchyard Cemetery of downtown Bowmanville. Not very many stones in each one, but at least they're all there. And I think it's only a dollar or two for the publication. Now, I was remiss and didn't get the June webinar in our publicity last month, so we missed it last week. Um, but between now and our September meeting, there's going to be three OGS webinars with very different subjects here. So uh, we've got uh, Penny Walters from England is going to be talking about diaspora and the homelands. Deborah Honor, who is uh, I believe it's Amherstburg, she's down in Essex County and um, been quite active in the Essex County branch. Upper Canada land petitions, more than just land acquisition. And Christine Woodcock from the Scottish Special Interest Group of the OGS uh, is going to be talking about researching Métis ancestors. So those will be very interested, interesting as well. And don't forget the conference. It's this month. It's coming up quickly. And I think you should check out the conference uh, 2022.ogs.on.ca um, website homepage for Penny Allen's speaker reviews. She's been doing a lot of blog postings as she interviews the speakers that are going to be presenting at the conference. I hope you've signed up for this great opportunity. The Durham Region Branch has taken a virtual booth for the conference. And remember, you're gonna have access to all the presentations for a month after the conference. They're gonna record them all. So at this point, uh, we're going to go to our main presentation, an introduction to GEDmatch. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mags Galden. She spoke for us last year as well on uh, Wikitree. Mags is a professional genealogist specializing in genetic genealogy. She's the founder of Grandma's Genes in Ottawa. After earning her bachelor's degree from Columbia College, she began her own genealogy as a hobby. This 30-year hobby eventually led her to be a leader role uh, within Wikitree. She is an international genetic genealogy lecturer, blogger, and social media maven. She serves as the admin for Facebook groups, including the International Society of Genetic Genealogists Facebook group. She is a former member of the Canadian Casualty Identification Team. Through her nonprofit work with MitoYDNA.org, Mags and other genetic genealogists are providing a free and accessible YDNA and mitochondrial DNA database for the genealogy community. And the motto is doing DNA right, mitoydna.org. So at this point, Mags, um, it's all up to you. So that's take great. A moment, please. Thanks, Nancy. And <clears throat> as far as the OGS conference, mitoydna has uh, a virtual booth as well. So looking forward to the conference coming up. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, and I wish I was going to be seeing you there, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I am Mags Galden of Grandma's Genes and MinorYDNA.org. 
And this is an introduction to GEDmatch. And it is an introduction to GEDmatch. If I was to do a series of GEDmatch presentations, I could cover everything that I would want to cover. Uh, so tonight, we're not going to be able to cover all of the tools. Uh, we're basically an introduction, but don't worry, I've got you covered on that. So GEDmatch is owned by a company uh, in California called Verigen. Uh, it's a forensic uh, genomics company. And you can see the information. It says, uh, next era of human identification discoveries going beyond the traditional DNA profile. So you kind of get an idea that they use next-gen <clears throat> next sequencing to, to do work. Um, for GEDmatch, GEDmatch offers a free DNA site built for the genetic genealogy community for research. And it's a global database and has tons of really great utilities. One of the things that they, they say, and, and Verigen has, has been pretty upfront and Brett, the owner, has uh, had lots of great meetings with people in the community, myself included. One of the things that you really wanna see is that, that in their mission statement, they say they leverage a large pool of data on the site to build family trees and birth families. And to be able to do research in genealogy, you really have to have a large database. You really have to be able to mine that information to be able to find things. I heard Cece Moore say at an I4GG conference a few years ago that finding a first cousin or finding a family member in the DNA databases that we have available now is, is just like dropping a, a rock in the pond. And when she was talking, she was talking more about just the United States, but it really has started to become Canada. Uh, Mexico is getting a big boost, even South America, Europe. That, those, this, these databases that are available to us are, are getting bigger and they're getting better. They also have this caveat in their mission statement that recent advancements have also allowed genetic genealogy to make communities safer by putting violent criminals behind bars and exonerating the innocent. Interesting point. And that, that kind of segues into GEDmatch's secondary entry portal. It's not one that we normally see as genealogists. I just wanted to show it to you. This is dedicated for LEO or law enforcement <clears throat> or LEA, law enforcement agency. Uh, this is called GEDmatch Pro. Um, it, it has a cost, uh, but we won't be covering it. It is just the, the entry portal for people doing work with uh, forensic genealogy and investigative, investigative genetic genealogy. I do want to point out that, that Verigen has changed the terms of service and privacy statement for their work. And this is something that's just happened recently. Uh, and, it, and it has to do with stillborn babies or newborn babies that have been found abandoned. And they're only using these services for law enforcement to use to identify the perpetrator of violent crime, where violent crime is defined as murder, non-elegant, non-negligent manslaughter, aggravated rape, robbery, aggravated assault, or to identify human remains, which for clarity, excludes fetal remains and remains of stillborn children, which I think is a really good thing that they have that statement in there and that their website is not used uh, for that. And why is that important to genetic genealogists? Well, protecting our privacy remains a type priority, and this is still talking about their mission statement, with their commitment to safeguard our information at the foreground of every decision. If you want to check out all of GEDmatch's terms of service and privacy statement, down at the bottom of every page on their site, there is this banner. And if you click on the policy in terms of use, you will get a good look at the information they have and when the last time the effective date was for any revisions to the terms of service. 
For registration, it's pretty simple. You're gonna type in your email, create a password and click login. Pretty easy. Uh, for the registration, just a name. If you don't want your name to appear on GEDmatch, you can change your name from my real name to Mags Galden, or you can even put in Daffy Duck. Uh, some people get kind of creative in the aliases they choose because they don't want to be out there as much as what some of us do. So you just go ahead and fill all this information. You click register. <clears throat> and if you need help, there is a May We Help You contact button that pops up and is on most of the pages in the newer edition of GEDmatch. And speaking of the new edition, you get to choose which GEDmatch experience you want. Would you like to sign into the new GEDmatch website or use the classic website? Now, the new website, if you remember back when they started doing the changeover, they were calling it Genesis. So we were all saying, oh, if you look at the new Genesis information, well, the new Genesis is actually the site now. And the old website is not a part of the site. Uh, and it, it is going to be shut down. They are eventually going to migrate everything over into the new site. They don't have a date for that, but it is coming. So get used to the, the new version because it's pretty, uh, it's pretty less of a, well, let's see what the old one looks like. Um, the old one was pretty much uh, a textual site. Uh, and the new one has prettier graphics and things like that. So the home page, uh, if home is really the link back to the dashboard. So if you if you're on one of the the, the pages and you want to get anywhere on the new version of GEDmatch, click on the home button and it will take you back to the dashboard. There's also a navigation bar that goes along the top of each one of the pages. If you click on the bars that have the little down arrow, you'll see that more information pops up as in the free tools list here. Uh, there are great forums in the GEDmatch stuff. They kind of started that over recently. So uh, if you go looking for it, realize that they are rebooting that. Not gonna list the tier one tools right now. You could check out family trees, GEDcoms that people have loaded. And you could do genealogy comparisons for those GED comps. And you also have the user uh, information for me, it's M. Galden. Sometimes when you're navigating some of the old pages that are shuffled into the new, you're gonna end up on a page where you don't have the home button or that navigation toolbar. Uh, so if you do, do a one-to-one -one comparison with somebody, you're gonna come to a page that doesn't have that. My suggestion to you to help you with your navigation on the site is to right click information that you want and then open in a new tab. That way you don't lose the information. A lot of times I leave the list of kits up so that I can quickly go back to the tab I have open to find kits that I wanna use uh, to look at something else or to pop it into another search query. Uh, so if we wanna do anything with our profile, uh, you can click on your name as uh, in that uh, homepage area in that navigation menu and it'll bring up your information. I'm user number and I don't, that user number doesn't seem to have really any importance to us. It's something that I'm sure they use. Uh, it gives your name and your email, and it shows how many DNA kits you may have. For the free version of uh, GEDmatch, the limit right now is for five kits only. Uh, you can have more kits if you were to upgrade to the Tier 1, but uh, we're going to be talking a lot about the free stuff tonight because this is an introductory. You can click on the View Edit to edit your information in your profile, such as that alias name, can see that my M. Galden has turned into Mags Galden. And I do that so that people realize that it's me. And when they contact me, they have some sort of frame of reference. You can also do an email password change from the profile page. You can work the tag group management information. Now, if you are familiar with the tag groups 
or the little colored dots over at Ancestry, uh, you can use the same kind of system on GEDmatch. You can identify different classes or different groups of people. So say that all of my uh, paternal stuff I've highlighted in blue and all of my maternal stuff I've put in pink, um, which is interesting because I always think of pink as my paternal grandmother's color. Uh, and I think of, of blue as my maternal grandmother's color. So I you really should do it differently, but I don't. I follow the traditional, the way you do it. So you can, you can add tag groups and you can add what the description is and stuff like that in the profile management area. Uh, you can share them or click that they're personal. You can change your communication settings. And that's uh, how often you'd like to receive email notifications. Um, and uh, for daily notifications, which I wouldn't suggest unless you're waiting for information, uh, do the weekly or none. And then you can use uh, information on how to do the thresholds to use for sending out new messages. And you can update it there. You can also go over to the profile registration deletion page. And they've got really big letters there that if you delete something, you're deleting it. So uh, be careful with that one, but that's the uh, profile management section for there. Uh, you can also access the edit profile page from the dashboard profile section. And we'll talk about that here uh, shortly. <clears throat> the dashboard, that's uh, the drop down under my name where we went to profile is where you can also get to the dashboard. The dashboard kind of looks like this. It's very small on this screen right now because it's really hard to try and get it all at once the way they have it laid out. But over here would be the list of kits. I have them uh, privatized, uh, but it's uh, there's information and we'll kind of go through each one of these sections. You've got this main section and then you've got this, this kind of right-hand side uh, information for what's on the page. So you get your name, you get some videos. Uh, the DNA fanatics have been doing a lot of videos for GEDmatch for help. So anytime you see one of those little buttons that say watch a video or if you want video help, try these. The DNA fanatics have been doing a lot of that for uh, GEDmatch. Um, and you can also check out the information on law enforcement. There's usually a message of the day, uh, clarification on changes for tier one and free accounts that started on May 1st and other information. Uh, over on the right hand side, there's the right side bar, uh, sidebar uh, with information, but we're gonna take a look real quickly at the basic information of the, the dashboard, which is underneath the name and uh, gives you information about the kits that you have. Usually gives a, a little thing saying how many people are in the, in the system as well. You get a legend about each one of the kits. Um, obviously I've privatized these a bit. Um, if you look, you've got a check sign. It means kits have completed uh, the phone, the, uh, Pencil mark is where you can click on it to do editing. If you have one that says likely duplicate, it may be deleted. I have one that says that on mine and it's for my uncle Rick and there's not a duplicate kit. So I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Uh, I guess I should call them or give them a note and ask them about it. R is the kit has completed all press processing and has good status. And the question mark, which would line up here would say, unknown status. And the R here uh, is for my two phased kits. I made phased kits for my mother uh, who passed away in 1994. Uh, also, you will find uh, over here with the uh, pencil, you can also see whether or not you have that kit uh, for law enforcement or not. And going down below that, you'll see the information where the GEDCOMs are listed. Uh, obviously, I have one from August of 2019. I probably need to update that one. And at the very bottom of the page, you can pay as you go tier one access or do a monthly or a yearly. Uh, and the tier one access gives you access to more advanced um, types of tools as well as 
uh, more bang for your buck on some of the results pages that they show you. And I'll tell you a little bit better more about that. The right hand side, now I know I'm showing it on the left, but the right hand side bar, uh, we're going to go quickly through that. You can do a loser, user, loser. That's hilarious. A user lookup to find out information about people who are in the system uh, who have, uh, who manage kits. Uh, you can go and check out the how to use information, check out the terms of service of privacy. You can check out what information they have about you, the last login. Uh, interesting kind of stuff to look at. Uh, education, GEDmatch education. Now that's all those great videos that the DNA fanatics have done. You can file a support request, request, which I should do to find out about why my uncle's kit appears to be a duplicate. Uh, you can upload your DNA uh, from the sidebar as well and check out the free tools. Uh, but we're gonna go through that a bit more uh, later. So we won't go through those right now. Uh, you can check out the GEDmatch forums. So here's that. And then also the tier one tools, which we will not be covering tonight, tier ones. But don't worry, I have you covered. I have you covered. You can also check out on that right hand sidebar uh, information about the GEDcoms that might be uploaded. Uh, and also check out uh, some of the GEDcom comparison and searches tools. And of course, the may we help you contact us form pops up pretty easily and pretty consistently throughout. One of the biggest questions that I have from people who talk to me about GEDmatch is how do I upload my DNA to GEDmatch? Uh, and really with any system or any DNA database, that's a big question is getting your system, your data information into the system and getting it in correctly. Uh, so we're going to kind of cover that pretty well for you here tonight. So GEDmatch has a raw DNA uh, upload utility. Uh, and of course, for the, for the free uh, membership that uh, you're limited to five, uh, and I have mine blurred out. So uh, you click on that upload your utility in the right hand taskbar, fill in the information, the name of the donor. And again, you don't have to put in uh, the, the real name in the alias option. The alias option is the one that's going to be displayed to the public, but you really should use the donor's real name in the database information here. So if it's M. Galden, we're going to put in M. Galden. And if there's an alias, we could put in Daffy Duck, like I said. Uh, you're going to go up to fill in the information for the sex of the donor rec that is recommended. Uh, and also, if you know what your mitochondrial DNA haplogroup, you can fill that information in here. Uh, GEDmatch just added this in the last month. They have integrated with mitoydna.org so that when you're on GEDmatch looking at your autosomal DNA results, you can see people who might have Y or mitochondrial DNA data over at GEDmatch with one click. You can take a look at those kits. Uh, same thing with your Y DNA. You'd put in your Y DNA haplogroup and your Mito Y DNA ID kit ID here. The name of the testing company and any other information you might want to put in here as well. For uploading your kit, you have to identify uh, that the raw data, and you have to agree to it, is one of the following. It's either your DNA. The DNA of a person for whom you are a legal guardian, the DNA of a person who has granted you specific authorization to upload their DNA to GEDmatch. So it in indicates that your personal uh, genetic research for genetic genealogy only and, and your violation of this, the foregoing may result in permanent suspension of your account. So you have to follow the rules on these. Uh, DNA of a person whose identity is known by you, but is known to be deceased. And again, it's for genetic genealogy research. Uh, an artificial DNA kit, uh, if and only if it is intended for research purposes, uh, or in, it's not being used to identify anyone in the GEDmatch database. DNA obtained from an artifact, a brush, a comb, something like that. Uh, 
anonymized sample for a donor to a large scale population study. Uh, so any, if you have anything above 50 individuals, you're going to be adding a lot of stuff. You want to do that. And then there is the none of the above. If you don't fit any of these categories, then you aren't allowed to upload to GEDmatch. Also, when we were talking about the opt-in uh, or about the login for Leo, the portal for GEDmatch Pro, this is where it becomes important for genetic genealogists. And you want to select the following privacy options for the kit. It's absolutely required. And the most popular, they say, is we'll compare your DNA kit to all other kits in the GEDmatch database to find your matching genetic relatives. Uh, these kits may include those submitted by users undertaking personal research, adoptive research, and users, including Leo, law enforcement, attempted to identify unidentified remains and law enforcement attempted to identify the perpetrators of violent crimes. Your kit will be compared with kits submitted by law enforcement to identify these people. So opt-in, and like I said, they have it identified as much as popular. If you opt out, then your kit will only be compared to all other kits in the GED match database to find your matches and the kits will not be commit, permitted to be compared to any of the uh, Leo kits. And then research, uh, that's basically for information for um, academic research or artificially corrected, uh, created stuff. And private means that your kit won't be available for matching. It's just giving you the opportunity to look at your data. File upload. Well, you have to you have to upload. Now they've got this thing in here that says build 37 GRCH37 slash. And the only place that you're going to find information about what build something is, is when you go to FTDNA. Otherwise, you're going to have to look really hard to try and find that information. So just keep in mind that it's build 37. Uh, but first, you have to get the file. So that means you have to go to the DNA database where you tested and download your data. And for 23andMe, uh, you go to your profile dropdown, then swing down to browse raw data, then up to um, the download tab. And then you have to read all of this information because they want you to realize that if you download your data and upload it somewhere else, they don't have anything to do with that. It's all up to you. You have to click that you understand the, the limitations and risks associated with it. And once you click that, you can click the submit request button. 23andMe wants you to realize that loading to third-party sites I mean, just like any other site, any site can be hacked. For Ancestry DNA, you go up to your uh, drop down menu for your personal account, click on account settings, go over to the DNA highlighted button, which opens a information box that has the DNA kits that you have on Ancestry. You click on that and it will open a box that says download. For family tree DNA, you go up to the uh, navigation menu at the very top of the page, click on results and tools, autosomal, then slide over to download raw data. Then, well, there's that build 37, click on it and you will download that. If you go over to my heritage, you click on DNA from their menu slide down to manage DNA kits, go over to the three buttons beside the download that you've got and click on download in the drop-down menu for that and you'll get that. For living DNA, you click on your uh, user, they have a left-hand sidebar and if you click on profiles, then uh, click on the download arrow looking icon. 
then slide over to give consent that you've read the information and provide permission to do this. Then click on download autosomal family ancestor raw marker data. But wherever you've downloaded the raw data file, it's going to go into your download folder or whatever folder you have designated as the download folder on your computer. And you can't just go and choose the file easily unless you click on that button. It will actually open your downloads folder for you. Uh, if it's not your download folder, navigate to it and you'll get a file that looks something like this. It has your name and it has that wonderful 37 number. I believe this is uh, an FTDNA file. You click on that and it will bring up that information and, and fill it in next to the choose file. And then you can click on upload and wait for the information to upload. I've already mentioned that there's two levels. Uh, there's the free tools and the tier one tools. And also don't worry about trying to remember all this. There is a handout for this. I've actually included uh, all of the slides that are important. Uh, so if you want to go back and try and figure out what I just said about downloading your files, you can do that easily in the download that Nancy uh, is going to be posting or Kim, one of these guys. So there's two membership level, levels, the free tools and the tier one tools. I am not gonna cover the tier one tools because I feel like that's more advanced. It's not really an introductory and I really don't have time. I could come back and do a, a whole presentation just on the tools. We're gonna run through those quickly. Uh, the free membership tools allows you to have five kits uploaded uh, and they are pretty uh, simple and pretty easy. The first one is the one to many tool. Uh, which is something that everybody should get used to looking at. Um, if you put in a, a kit number, this is my kit number here, uh, you can go through and click whether you want to look at autosomal or X. You can define if you want to have a, a certain offset with it. Uh, you can say you want just 50 to show up or you want 100 to show up. Uh, there is a limit based on the free version as compared to the uh, tier one version. You can say that you want the Cinemorgan size to be seven or above. Uh, you can display or not display tag groups. And you can also have an overlap cutoff. And the overlap is the amount of uh, DNA that you would overlap with somebody else. Um, you click on submit and you get a printout. Let's see, this is, uh, if you notice, I tried to overclock it. So if you put in too much information, if you wanna try and run something that the, the free doesn't allow, you'll get a little note that says additional facilities in tier one to many versions. So you'll get a note like that. And then you also get a little box that says, you're gonna check out tier one, you can't have more than 3000 for the overlap on that one. So we go back to what we had before and get the one to many version to come up. Now this shows every single possible person that you match on GEDmatch based on whether you have a free version or the tier one version. So a free version, we had 50 that were gonna come up. You can see right here, it mentions that I have one of 51 matches. Um, if I've got questions, I can click on this tips and the tips will pop up and show us. Like I said, there's watch videos for video help as you're going through this. Um, you'll notice that there's some information on here that is grayed out, like the visualization options are grayed out, as well are the little check boxes beside each one of these, uh, these people. Now I have it all privatized. But with a free version, you don't get to do some of the stuff. Like I can't type a name into that search box, but I can press the up down arrows to rearrange the listing into an alphabetical order. Or if I wanna see how all the newest ones uh, fast, I can check on the tips. Um, and if you noticed in this screen, you notice that there's some colors that pop up and there's this little um, guide that shows 
that if you've got a new test that's showing up in your GEDmatch match list, it's going to show up as uh, different gradients of green to show you that you've got a new match. And for the, um, the other information about the overlaps, uh, it's going to show up in gradients of pink. So you'll be able to see what um, seven highlighted in pink uh, and the results shown below uh, use thresholds less than seven. So you'll see that information as well to help you make decisions about what you're seeing in this. Uh, like I said, you can have those tag groups show up. Again, I have this all privatized so you can't see the names, but the kit number would appear here. And you can see that um, from what I did, I had the green set up to be my father's side. And then, or actually the green is set up to be my mother's maternal side. The blue is set up, the green is set up to be my mother's paternal side. The blue is set up to be my father's paternal side. And the pink is set up to be my mother's maternal side. And I can also see over here that I've got a couple of places where that um, the SNPs aren't what they should be, or they should, I should have more SNPs here. These are second cousins to me, if I remember correctly. But you also have other information um, showing you those. You got the names that you can set up to uh, look at in, in alphabetical order. You can do alphabetical order on the emails, uh, which GEDmatch shows you to everybody. If you have your email listed in GEDmatch, then you are going to have your email show up. So if you don't want your personal email to be in the results of, of thousands, tens of thousands of people, then you might want to create an email that's like magsgenealogy at gmail.com. Or, or whatever you would want to set up. That's, that's kind of an anonymous thing. I think though, if people saw mags, they would figure out it was me, but you could do that. So uh, just keep in mind that if your email is there, you can, you can absolutely see everybody's email on, on the matches list. Uh, whether or not the kit has a wiki tree link or a GED match associated with it, you can see how many days old the kit is, and obviously these are pretty recent, except for this one, and that one's still not terribly recent. Uh, you can see whether it's version two or not. Uh, you can see the sex of the tester or the donor for the kit, and you can do the toggle for uh, males or females. You can check out the HAPA groups. If, if I had a HAPA group in here for this one, I would be able to do that. I have an H1 down here for this person. Uh, I've got Y-DNA showing up, and I've got haplogroups for all of these people, and a mitoydna.org uh, link that I can click, and I can actually go to mitoydna and look at this Y-DNA information for this kit. Uh, I can see that this person that I am looking at is probably my parent, based on the amount of shared information there, that 3568.3. Uh, I can look at the autosomal total. I can look at the largest amount of share, which is also pointing to this being a parent. Uh, and since they have a Y DNA, it has to be my dad. Uh, I can look at the generations. Now in autosomal DNA, when we say generation distance, we're talking about the number of generations from you. So I would be zero and one would be my parent. And obviously we've been talking about this person being my, my dad. And then if it's my second cousin, then I probably have a 2.14 generation distance. So generation distance is how many generations back, starting with you as zero, uh, that you would find a common recent ancestor. And thankfully I only have one generation to my dad. Uh, you can see the total cinnamorgans of shared for X DNA, and you can do the toggle there to uh, rearrange the numbers in descending or ascending uh, forms. And uh, you can see the migration and the SNP overlap for each one in the, uh, in the autosomal and the X DNA there. So the one to many is a really good, good 
thing. And if you want to download all of that, you can hit control A, control C. I'm not sure what it is for the Mac. And you can dump all of that information into a spreadsheet, which when I first started doing this, that's all I did is I went to every Jed match match I could do. I did the one ones. I did the downloading all of that stuff. Um, but now there's tools that you can use that kind of do all that stuff for you, like DNA Jedcom or Genomate Pro. Uh, the relationship prob probability. Now that is a brand new thing uh, that Verigen has just added to GEDmatch. Uh, it's done by Britt Nicholson. Uh, and what you do is you type in the amount of shared DNA that you and this, this person have, and it will tell you what the probability, it uses the law of probabilities to state what that relationship would be. So a half sibling would be 34.6% or an aunt, uncle, or nephew, 36.4, or a grandparent, grandchild, 28.9. So the person who would share 906 with me would be a very close relative. Um, I'm not quite sure why they have the subgroup maternal and paternal because you cannot tell based on a number which side of the family it's on. I think that's kind of a misnomer that they have maternal or paternal listed here. Um, because you can't tell. You can't tell which side of the family is unless you've got a lot more information. And then, like I said, it's the law of probabilities where it's 18.6% it's that it's possibly a half sibling, 18.3% uh, that it could be an aunt, uncle, nephew, and then 15. So those really aren't big probabilities uh, that show this. And this is really not giving me a lot of information. I could tell you the 1906.4 that I put in was actually for a sibling. So I know the answer to this question. And I also know that this sibling is on the paternal side of the family. And like I said, this, it cannot tell you which side of the family it's on. So that's a little bit of a misnomer. When you talk about doing relationship pr probabilities, that's good. You're using the law of probabilities. Um, and it's, it's good work that, that Britt has put that together. But I really prefer to use the Shared Cinemorgan project that, that Blaine Bess Bettinger has worked on for years. Uh, I asked him last week what his latest total is. And he has 60,000 people who have tested and have reported to him what the range of relationship between the tester and the person that he, that are reporting it for and the numbers that go with those. So I, I think that having a statistical analysis based on the statistics of actual testers would carry more weight uh, when you're doing a relationship test. Um, and I think that this also gives you a good diagram of if this is the tester and this, these are the probabilities that this, this could be. It still uses the law of probabilities, which uh, Leia Larkin has, um, where you can look at the uh, information there. So that's kind of, kind of a new thing. I'm not really sure about it yet, but um, still testing it out. You can do a one-to-one -one autosomal uh, run for people. And this is between myself and my second cousin. And what I told the one-to-one -to, -one to do was to give me a graphical analysis of my match to this other person. And I asked it also to give me the actual numbers involved. It shows me each one of the chromosomes. So we don't have any matches on chromosome one, but on chromosome two, we did. And it, it shows me the starting position on the chromosome and the end position on the chromosome. And it tells me how many centimorgans I share on that one particular uh, stretch of that chromosome and how many SNPs were used in defining that match. And also shows me the other location. And if I'm looking for triangulation, which is when I take three different testers and I compare them, having the start and end positions for each one of these testers and what chromosome they're on is a very important thing to have. 
So being able to do a one-to-one study and compare this with other testers who have a match on chromosome two, you want to find them in here to be able to do some of that triangulation work that you've heard about. You can also do a one-to-one -one with the X matches that you have. You can also run information about the admixture uh, that you have. Now, admixture is the way that uh, GEDmatch says uh, the origins estimates. Now, a lot of people use the word ethnicity in that, and ethnicity is really a misnomer again, because we aren't talking about somebody's ethnicity when we're talking about origins. We're talking about where a set of people or a group of people were geographically when mutations happened in their DNA. So admixture for uh, GEDmatch, uh, they have a really good uh, whole suite of tools that you can do. Uh, since I am European in origin, I did the Eurogenes K13. Uh, you can see my kit number here, and it gives the information on where my origins are, North Atlantic, Baltic a little bit, uh, Western Mediterranean, Eastern Asian, Eastern Mediterranean, and South Asian, which is interesting because I don't have this deep analysis to these this, this area here in any of the other testing companies. And I can play with it and look at different things, but this is really the best one for me. And it actually gives me the percentage. And the North Atlantic is my uh, Scandinavian, my Irish, uh, my Scots-Irish, if I really have any, uh, and that kind of information. You can do other things as well. You can play with the rotating 3D uh, chart as well. Um, so it's a new feature. Not a new feature, but a feature that you can do new things with uh, constantly to change and look at how your uh, heritage adds, um, adds up. There's a blog called Genealogical Musings, which is not Genia Musings, which is Randy Seaver. I actually don't know who has written this blog, but it's a go-to for me. It identifies all of the ways that you can use GEDmatch's admixture features. And it's a great guide. Uh, whoever writes this put it together in 2017. And the link for that is down at the bottom of the page. Like I said, there's uh, slides for available for you later. Uh, you can also check to see if uh, two people uh, are matched by so many people um, matching both or one of two people. And you do that by putting in uh, two different uh, kit IDs. So I took the uh, kit out, the, the name out, and I privatized all of this, but it'll give you the name, uh, give you the kit number. i also give you the information about whether there's a, a GEDCOM or a Wikitree link, the number of generational difference, and it'll compare, it'll, sh it'll show the, the person's name, say this is Babette, and this is my kit number. And here's the other person that I wanted to check. So their kit number is here. So for me, this person would match me at 98 Cinemorgans with the largest of that match being 25.5. That's the largest segment on that chromosome that I match of that 98. And the generations for me back to a common ancestor with this person would be 3.6. Now you see this uh, other lady, you can see her numbers as well in the 38, the 3.8 uh, generational distance back. So we're looking at somebody who has the same kind of generational distance. And it might be interesting to do a one to one compare of all three of these kits. And you kind of have to do it on your own until you get into some of the triangulation uh, ability in the tier one. So this is a fun thing. It's a good thing to do. Um, and also the email is given, as I said before, the emails are listed. Uh, the DNA file diagnostics, I'm not gonna go into that, uh, but you can check to make sure that your DNA file is good when you're running stuff. One of the most important tools in the industry, bar none, is David Pike, who is a fine Canadian mathematician out at Memorial University. Uh, he created this 
are your parents related tool. Now, if you're going to be doing work where you're trying to figure out a family history and your family is related and you're looking at Cinemorgan levels, the Cinemorgan level for two people who are cousins is greatly increased if there's endogamy, meaning that two cousins have married each other. Those numbers aren't going to be the same as if these people weren't related. So it's really important to run a, a, a run of homogeneity. There you go. I said it. Um, and it'll tell you all the places that, that you might or might not be related, your parents. Uh, and thankfully for me, my parents are probably not related in recent generations. And it'll help me when I'm doing my work, I'm not looking for those larger numbers. Uh, some communities that have high endogamy, uh, instead of putting your number at number seven for Cinemorgans for the lower threshold, you're gonna wanna bump that up to 20. Uh, some Jewish communities would have 20 or people who lived on islands, people from Cuba, you would wanna bump their numbers up to 20. Uh, Kitty Cooper, Kitty Cooper, I have not mentioned yet. But Kitty Cooper is the most prolific blogger, speaker of everything uh, Jedmatch that you can imagine. Um, she's also a programmer, and as I understand it, was has helped them over the years. Uh, I have her blog down here, When the DNA Says Your Parents Are Related. She's got a great blog to uh, point out information about endogamy and why this tool, the Are Your Parents Related tool, is so important to genetic genealogy. The 3D Cromer, a chromosome browser, it's a great uh, browser and you can change it and manipulate it and look at stuff. But what I like about it is the matrix that it gives you. Uh, I didn't get that up. We're not gonna look at DNA, archaic DNA matches. Those are matches from ancient times. But we are gonna talk a bit about the Ancestors Projects. Ancestors Projects, are GEDmatch's version of uh, DNA group projects, um, like what you would have at, D at uh, Family Tree DNA, where you are looking at why in mitochondrial DNA. Well, Ancestry has these ancestor projects, and what they do is they get people to join the project so that when you do analysis within a group, you, you're only matching the other people in the group. So I'm a member of the County Antrim and County Down Ancestors. I'm also a member of the South Carolina Ancestors, 1600s to 1700s, because that's where my people came in. I would plop in my GEDmatch ID and click on it, and it would give me a list of people for the project that I choose. Now, these projects um, have to have a companion to them, to list information about the users, possibly uh, their lineages. Uh, and so what GEDmatch uses is Facebook. They use Facebook to, to provide a, a, a platform for people that join these ancestor projects to be able to talk and to communicate and to to post in these private uh, areas their GEDmatch kit numbers so that they can share information and do those one-to-one -one comparisons to see if they have a good earliest known ancestor within that genealogical time frame. The tier one memberships, just to go through really quickly, the one-to-one, one-to-many classic version is the same version that we were looking at earlier, except all the bells and whistles are available, and you can do, um, you can toggle those uh, numbers up as high or as low as you want to. Uh, the Q-matching one-to-one is another fun thing. The segment search, looking at the one-to-one -one segments for on chromosome two, you can do the phasing tool, which can identify uh, your parent that uh, is has passed away, like I created a phase kit for my mother. Uh, you can run triangulation where you're comparing three kits at a time. Uh, you can do auto kinship. You can do mo multiple kit analysis. The Lazarus tool is a really cool tool where you get as many of your cousins to test as you can 
and you basically build a DNA kit for a, a long lost relative, uh, which is really cool. Kevin Borland with Borland Genetics also has kind of a turbocharged version of that. Uh, my evil twin, I always think of Blaine Bettinger when I see that because he has a great talk about how he created an evil twin. It's just uh, creating a second profile of you, uh, which is fun. And then you can combine multiple kits into a super kit, which I have done. I've got living DNA, my ancestry kit and my FTDNA kit all combined into one kit. Uh, and then you can find the most recent common ancestor from DNA matches and surname matches from DNA matches. Uh, did I go? Oh, and Oh, I almost missed it. The auto tree clustering tool, which is uh, Jan, um, I'm going blank now. He, uh, the DNA, <laughs> it's where you can take the leads method of giving colors to each one of your ancestors. And upon that, you build these cluster groups of colors associated with each one of the testers and it shows up, but you have to go back and figure out which color belongs to which family group, which is really good to go back and actually do the leads method. So that's a, that's a quick overview of the tier one tools. And I really have to say that if you really want to do some exploring about GEDmatch, look Kitty Men Munson Cooper up and look up her blog. Um, she has, uh, her blog is blog.kittycooper.com. She just did a seminar or webinar like yesterday or the day before for Verigen, uh, where she talks about all of the tools at GEDmatch and the basics for finding relatives and more. She does a really good job at talking about the tools and the information about Something that's pretty uh, important to the genealogy community. The um, GEDmatch is something that provides us a database that's accessible. It's free to a point. Uh, and if you can't get your DNA up on Ancestry, other people who have done Ancestry tests can put their stuff up on GEDmatch. So you can match to people who have tested at companies that you haven't tested at. So it, it's a great, it's a great way to be able to find information to, to really dig deep into some of the math of what genetic genealogy is, and it's a great way to find cousins. Uh, and I, I thank you very much. Check out Kitty Munson Cooper's blog, and I appreciate you guys watching tonight. Well, Mags, that was a whirlwind tour. It was fast. I, there's, there's really, you really, you have to have more time. Yes, you really do. It, it is very common. I, I have a complaint about GEDmatch in that the names of their tools are totally stupid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it takes me a long time to figure out which tool does what. Well, I hope that I just helped you a bit. You did. You did. Good. So I do have some questions for Great. you. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, Barbara. Um, she asked, what are phased kits? Phased kits are when you um, define whether it's your mother's side of the family or your father's side of the family. So phasing means identifying whether something, a kit is up on your paternal side or your maternal side. Okay, now, do you have to have one of the parents in order to do that? Um, yes, for the most part. Um, and you can create a kit through the Lazarus tool, but you have to have lots of cousins tested to be able to do that. Okay, but to use the phasing tool, you need one of the parents. Yeah, tested. yeah. Yeah, at least one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, and then Vicky uh, Vicky G is asking, uh, what is raw DNA? So your we... raw DNA file, woo, it's a ser it's a text file with a series of letters of four letters A C T G, and when you get this file, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of repetitions of those letters in different in different formulas. And so that raw data file is what 
you get when you do your DNA test. You get this series of these letters. And what GEDmatch or Family Tree DNA or Ancestry, whoever, they can take that information and based on those letters, tell you information that you can understand so that you aren't looking at a raw data file of just all of those letters. So a raw data file is just the letters that represent your, your genetics. And don't ever try to print it. No, <laughs> you'll <laughs> run out of ink or paper one. Yes. Um, Elaine is asking, which company is better to use to upload your DNA from Ancestry, MyHeritage, or 23andMe? Well, the, the thinking on that is this. Ancestry DNA has the largest gene pool by miles than anybody else. And if you upload to Ancestry, you're highly likely to find a lot of matches. Um, for me, I didn't upload to Ancestry for a long time, just just because. Uh, and a friend, my friend Rob said, hey, you should upload to Ancestry. I'm like, why? And he's like, oh, just do it. And I did. And I discovered kind of a socioeconomic thing is, you know, all of those great advertisements that they do where somebody's dancing around in lederhose and, you know, proud of their ancestry being German. And they take a, a test and they find out they're really Italian. So they, they start baking lasagna for the family. That kind of advertising has really targeted every person or every man or every woman, whatever you want to call it. And, and so, so many people have tested on Ancestry that it's interesting that all of my uh, family from a certain area have all tested with FTDNA and the other half of my family has tested with Ancestry. So... I really kind of hit pay dirt when I tested with Ancestry because I, it opened up a lot of new matches for me. So I would test with Ancestry first or with 23andMe. If you have uh, a desire to find out medical information, I would test with 23andMe first. They also have a very large, they are the second largest database there is. Uh, but neither one of those companies allow uploads into their system. You actually have to do the spit test and get a kit into them to be able to be in their database. But you can download their data and upload them elsewhere. You can upload ancestry kits into FTDNA. You can upload them into GEDmatch. So the way I suggest is to go to Ancestry or to, to 23andMe first and then also test at some of the other companies, because like my experience, I discovered a whole other side of my family that I, I didn't have at one of the other testing companies. I think she it maybe is alluding to whether or not the raw DNA file is better from one company or another when you're uploading to GEDmatch. Um, no, not really. Not just for the upload to GEDmatch. Um, they all use kind of a different chip in their in their analysis, um, but I really suggest if you're going to upload several kits, if you're doing several tests at several companies, to, to combine them into that super kit, so you kind of get all of the good from all of the companies into one kit. That's interesting. Now, um, if you're doing that and you're in the free version. That takes up three of your five kits, doesn't it? Unless you take it and you merge it and you delete them. Ah, oh, oh. good tip. Okay, so uh, Richard is asking if I've tested with three different companies, should I download and upload my raw data from each of them? And I think you've answered that. I just answered that, yeah. You did. And then you can create a super kit. Perfect. Eleanor is asking for downloading if one company such as Living DNA is using the DNA from another company such as Family Tree DNA, is there any reason to download from both companies? That's sort of partially related to the other two we just did. Right, right. Living DNA uh, does not use DNA from another company unless you upload your DNA to them. Um, so if you do a test with Living DNA, they are actually using their system, their algorithms to work up your raw data file. Uh, so if I understand correctly, 
if you did a test with living DNA, you, you would not have FTDNA information. My heritage uh, is the only company currently using FTDNA as its science lab. Um, but if you test with my heritage, you're going to be in a different set of data for all of the matches you have uh, at, at my heritage. And it's the same thing for family tree DNA. Even though it's the same testing laboratory, it's a different set of data based on who's in that. Uh, because not everybody who's at FTDNA would have tested at my heritage, if you get what I'm meaning. Okay. I think I get the impression she's actually put her FTDNA results up in living DNA and is asking whether she should download both of those into GEDmatch. And there, I, that wouldn't make any sense to yeah, me. Yeah, no, I wouldn't do that. Um, but I would say if you are of Eastern European heritage, I would actually do a living DNA test because they have such an interesting way that they are working. Uh, they actually started in small villages in small towns and small counties and actually did a specific testing pattern. And they've slowly been working out in concentric circles since then. And they're, they're way out now, way, way past Germany and out into the Mediterranean now. And I, I really appreciate the way they've been working. And I also think that their origins estimates for me, for myself, for what I know about the genealogical work I've done, that they are the closest to being accurate uh, oh. for my origins information. So I would highly suggest testing with them as well. Oh, I'm gonna have to go back and look at my kit there. <laughs> okay, Vicki is asking, have you personally found matches through GEDmatch that you didn't find on the individual DNA sites like Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, et cetera? Yes. Yes, I did. Because I didn't test at Ancestry for a long time. I personally haven't tested at 23andMe. So those two testing uh, kits that, that show up within my matches are all people that I wouldn't have matched to unless they had been at GEDmatch. So yes, absolutely, I've found matches. Very good. Uh, Debbie is asking, what is your most successful match or find? It looks like you email a person if matching is found. Do most people that you contact respond when contacted? Or are people on GEDcom um, I think she means Jed Match. Right. Um, to learn and not to connect with others. You know, that's an interesting thing. I, in my experience with Jed Match, is I would say eighty percent of the people that I have reached out to have contacted me back. So a, about twenty percent have not. Um, and I think that for the different testing companies, that that goes up and down. I think at Ancestry, there's a lot lower success rate because there are so many people who have been gifted a test at Ancestry who really aren't interested in genealogy because it's really, it's really us geeks that are the genealogists that are really interested in getting in touch with people. And I've talked to so many people who say, yeah, I got a test kit and I really don't care about the rest of it. You know, yeah. so yeah, you have to kind of look at who's tested it where. I think um, a success rate at FTDNA is pretty high for contacting people in my experience. Um, I've also had a pretty good success with uh, 23andMe and MyHeritage uh, and Living DNA. Okay. Uh, Elaine's asking, can you change your privacy settings after you have set them? Yes, for each kit. Okay. On the, um, on the dashboard, click on the little uh, pencil. Okay. Uh, so Sunday is Sunday is asking, uh, you have police on your page, some were crossed out, one wasn't. What does that mean? Those are the kits that are available for law enforcement. And the ones that are crossed out are the ones that I have that are not available for law enforcement. Okay. And she also is asking, I have a number of cousins named Cooper. How do I find out how they are related? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. That's a that's a big question. Um, I suggest reading uh, Kitty Cooper's blog. 
Roberta Estes has a lot of really good blogs about finding your relatives and finding information from autosomal DNA. Um, I could reel off a bunch of other people, Leah Larkin. Um, let's see who else, Blaine Bettinger. You could, you could just look up finding my relatives through DNA, and you're going to get a list of people. Uh, Roberta Estes is probably the most prolific um, blogger for all of genetic genealogy. Uh, so I would kind of, I would kind of go with her stuff. She's got a, a couple of really great series on, on doing that. Okay, I'm putting her name into the chat. So you know how it's spelled. Yep. And I would put Kitty, well, and Kitty Cooper. I don't have Roberta mentioned in my slides, but I do have Kitty. Okay. Um, okay, so Mags mentioned updating her GEDCOM and resubmitting it. Please explain. So the GED, yeah, I think people get confused between GEDmatch and GEDCOM. So right. start there. <laughs> yeah, GEDmatch is the company that's giving us a database to do all this comparison of. And a GEDCOM is a file of our genealogy. So you can't really do DNA matching without good genealogy. So when you have your, your numbers on a site and I want to look and try and find out how I'm related to you, and you don't have an earliest known ancestor listed or a GEDCOM, I have to contact you and hope that you're going to answer my question. But if I have a GEDCOM posted, a file of my genealogy, you'll be able to look through my family files and see if I have any matching information to your family, like surnames or locations. So uh, yeah, that's... Um, that's something you would do. Now, I have a GEDCOM up that I put up in 2019. Uh, I have obviously had a lot of work done on my tree since then, not as much as I'd like because as a professional genealogist, it's like the cobbler's children have no shoes, so my genealogy isn't as good as it should be because uh, I'm working on other stuff. But I would want to delete that GEDCOM and then upload a new one to replace it with the new information that I have now. I actually did that just recently at FTDNA because I'm getting my father's Y, big Y done, and I just uploaded a new GEDCOM to FTDNA for him. Okay. I also link off to Wikitree, which is my chosen online platform for my genealogy. Okay. So... Um... I've got a couple of comments and another question about uploading to Ancestry. And I can just say right there, you can't not upload to Ancestry. You must take their test. Right. And um, so I think the one question that says, how do you find uh, how those Coopers are related? I have an answer here from someone else. It says, do your genealogy. Yeah. <laughs> Start yeah. looking at their trees and contacting them. Yeah, and if you're related to Kitty Cooper, you're going to find out really fast how you're related. Yeah, but Kitty Cooper is basically Southern U.S., isn't she? No, um, actually, she's not. Um, she's got tons and tons of Norwegian. Her surname is, uh, her maiden name is Munson. Oh. Um, so I think there's Utah connections out, out west. Okay. Um, if you have tested and or uploaded with every DNA company, is there any value in using GEDmatch? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, GEDmatch has a different set of tools than everybody else has. Um, and they, they, they I, I would say uploading to everybody and then also using everybody's specific tools um, and GEDmatch has the tools that some of the tools that nobody else has. So yeah, uploading to GEDmatch is good. It's also, what about those people who aren't on the system that you're on and those matches you might find at GEDmatch who haven't tested at your company? So that's another good reason to upload to GEDmatch. Yeah. And there are more, uh, there are more DNA companies than the five that we genealogists use. <laughs> so... Um, and I believe they can upload from other companies besides the big five that we know about. Um, so long as they have the information and the correct thing. I don't know. I don't know of any other autosomal DNA testing companies other than the, the big five. There are other 
why in mitochondrial DNA testing companies and whole genome testing companies, um, I'm not really sure about downloading that kind of information into GEDmatch. Okay. So Rosalind is asking, why did you allow the police to look at some and not other kits? Um, just based on um, the fact that I have asked people to do testing for me and I haven't gone back and gotten their permission to have Leo and most of them are family members. So I know kind of that I want to protect them just for myself. So no, I haven't put them up. I don't think my family, my family's so boring. There's absolutely nothing interesting in my family. So I, I, I'm not sure that we have any criminals uh, that they would find. It's just, I'm being protective of family members. Yeah, uh, I, I did quite a few tests before the Leo uh, option was there. And like you said, I've never gone back to ask specifically about that. And actually a couple of them are now deceased. So I'll never get permission for them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't open up kits unless somebody actually contacts me and says, I want to have it, have it open. I have mine open uh, because I know I'm completely innocent yes. of anything ever. <laughs> Same here. I'm knocking uh, on wood, by the way. <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, I have. <laughs> From Jacqueline Wilson, uh, she asked, uh, would you recommend getting the full mitochondrial DNA test done? Yeah, I, you know, the full mitochondrial DNA test was the very first test that I did because my boring family, there's only one thing. Uh, my grandmother grew up in a children's home in Columbia, South Carolina, and I never knew why. And it's like this weird thing in our family. So I wanted to test uh, to see if she actually was related to the family that she thought was her family. And she absolutely is. But that was the very first test I took. And it did show that she was related. Working with mitochondrial DNA is, is different than working with Y-DNA and autosomal DNA because we live in a patrilineal society or a patriarchal society where women often take the name of their husbands. So we lose track of their maiden name uh, a lot. Uh, my earliest known ancestor is Anne Unknown, uh, and she married this fellow named Hall. Uh, they lived in Halls Creek in Towns County, Georgia, but I really can't find any more information about them. And I can't find any more information about her, but all of my autosomal DNA or all of my mitochondrial DNA testers seem to all be from the same area and follow migration patterns from Ireland and the west of Scotland into the Appalachian Mountains. So there's, there's clues and hints in there, but you have to work it kind of a different way. It is difficult. Um, um, I have a, I actually have a mitochondrial DNA talk on family legacy, family tree webinars. If you're a member, you can check that out. Uh, and, and it actually goes into some of the, the tricks that you can do to try and find your family using mitochondrial DNA. And our last one is from Lori, who says, how did you color code people in GEDmatch? <laughs> is that another talk? <laughs> yeah, that's another talk, but that was the tag system. Uh, okay. One of the very first screens that I showed, um, showed tabs where you could do the tag system and you just go in and identify the name of the group that you want to create a color for and mine was Galding and the the color was blue because that's my patrilineal line and then I, I did pink for uh, my mother's matrilineal line and I did green for my mother's patrilineal line. Um, if you look up tag groups at GEDmatch, you're going to find some of those great videos that the uh, DNA fanatics have put out for GEDmatch for that. Yes, very good point. And, and I see all the DNA video, videos that, that Andy puts out, yeah. and he covers just about every aspect going. He does, and they're very well edited, and they're easy to follow. So yeah, check those out. So I've gotten a lot of uh, uh, thank yous, great presentation. I have a better understanding of GEDmatch now. Uh, thank you, Mags. Um, 
and what I've got several other ones that uh, uh, earlier on that inserted themselves between some of the uh, questions. So um, here's Rosalind saying thank you for the great handout as well. Oh, good, good. Okay, that leads to the handout. Anybody on an iPad, you obviously won't have gotten the link. And, um, but uh, Kim has put in there um, my email that you can ask for me to attach the uh, handout and send it to you. Um, and it's durhamchair at ogs.on.ca again. So uh, go, come right ahead. And, um, oh, we got one stray little thing right here about the mitochondrial DNA. Jackie says that her first test was uh, 2009, but she has yet to upgrade it to the full test and wonders if it would be useful. I am adopted and have found my birth mother, but my, not my father. So it definitely won't help with that. Re read goal. me the main part of that question again. Please. She had her first mitochondrial DNA test at Family Tree DNA in 2009, right. but she has not uh, upgraded to the full mitochondrial DNA. Um, finding your father won't be affected by your mitochondrial DNA tests. Um, okay. Do you have any siblings that you know of that are alive? Okay, well, we'll see if she can. Well, and uh, the question is, if you have a living brother, who would be willing to do a Y DNA test, who's your biological brother, then I would do that. Otherwise, you're gonna need to use autosomal DNA and use that information. And you don't have to have one of your parents to do manual phasing to actually work out which family group belongs to which DNA testers using the leads method. Yes. Um, and if you want to check out information about the leads method, that is a, my suggestion for you to identify the different parts of your family tree is, is using that. It's Dana Leads. And if you just Google the leads method and click on her link, because a lot of people talk about her method, but Dana really gives the best version of it. I think Diane Southard uh, comes along with the, the second best version of Dana Leads method. So check the leads method out online and figure out how to identify your family using that. Okay, I'm just putting that into the yep. everyone. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much, Mags. And thank you for answering so many questions for us. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for the direct messages people are sending me as well. I, I love talking, obviously, and thank you for coming and listening to me banter on. Oh, good, because I obviously I don't see those ones. So thank you so very much for uh, monitoring your own chat. <laughs> OK. Um, Malcolm. Malcolm uh, has said I didn't ask a certain question and I did not get that question. I'm sorry, Malcolm. It did not come directly to me. Um, so we're getting thank yous. Um, okay, so I am going to um, move on at this point. And um, I have a little video. Uh, to share with you. This is the one, I hope I've picked the right one. Yes, just a quick video with Stephen Wood. Welcome to the Durham Region Branch Library and Office. Today, we're going to give you a quick overview of what materials are contained here. In this area, we have all our family histories. It's organized by surname. On the top shelf here, we have our military collection. With the next row, our Durham Region Branch local history books. Below that is our local history books for other areas of Ontario and a little bit of miscellaneous on the bottom. Over here is our USA collection.
On this shelf, we have our cemetery binders and a collection of telephone books below that. While our directories are all on this shelf. This section here has our church records and also our collection of how-to material. A little bit of land records completes the collection. On the top here is our places of worship collection plus miscellaneous newspaper notices and uh, things in book form. On this side, we have our marriage registers and newspaper collection. That is also what is contained on that uh, following shelf. Microfilms and fiche are all in this cabinet here. Well, we have our yearbook collection on top, arranged by locality and school. We have a good collection of maps, assorted magazines on top here. While we have uh, the UK collection on the next two bookcases, plus other provinces. That is a quick overview of what is here and we welcome you to the library anytime you can come. That's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> um, so you should be seeing the helpers needed for the cemetery slide now. Yep. Okay, good. So um, as I have done the last several meetings, it's just about time to get out in the cemeteries and bring those, uh, those active cemeteries up to date. Uh, some of them were transcribed 40 years ago. I, I find it so hard to believe, but this is our 40th year of existence. So if you've got a cemetery that's your favorite, let us know, offer to help update it, and it will move up our list very quickly. I'll tell you that right now. So just send me an email um, or send the branch an email and mark at cemeteries, derm at ogs.on.ca. And I have a special meeting coming up. The uh, DNA special interest group meeting is uh, June 15th uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, the link to sign up for this meeting is on our website. Um, I requested it today, so it's either on or will be on very early tomorrow. Dan's very quick at, at uh, changing things for me. And it's, uh, you're going to have a fabulous speak speaker, you're going to have me. But it's a, a, an exploration of the DNA section of the Ancestry website and all the clues that you can get from your matches. So I do hope that you will uh, sign up and come on out. It's open to the public. Um, our next meeting is the 6th of September at 7.30 p.m. Uh, it's Ontario's Records of Inheritance on Family Search by Jane McNamara, who wrote the book on inheritance in Ontario. So wills and other records like estate file uh, documents and um, Family Search is is uh, coming along with opening up the uh, microfilms of uh, Ontario's uh, estate files and wills. We've got uh, meetings set up till the end of the year. In October, we've got Durham Region newspapers, uh, a little bit of an emphasis on Oshawa papers, but. Jennifer promised me she'll uh, put in access information for other papers in the region. Uh, in November, we've got Elaine Lievert, who is uh, the histor historical librarian. Mm, that didn't come out right. Um, she's the librarian who manages the history section of the Ajax Public Library. And she's gonna talk about bomb girls. 
Life at the Defense Industries Limited plant in Ajax in World War II and afterwards. And don't forget that I am planning for the next 12 months. Uh, I haven't got a lot set up in 2023 yet. So if you've got a burning topic you would like to hear and we haven't done it in the last couple of years, put it in the chat right now or you can email me at durhamchair at ogs.on.ca with your suggestions. It would be much appreciated. Uh, this is the details on the research room, um, second and the third Friday mornings. Two people and email Stephen Wood at durhamresearch at ogs.on.ca. Um, contact information, and I'm going to stop any PowerPoint here, but I think we've got a few minutes. Let me stop my share. If I can get to it. There's my pointer. There we go. And, oh, I guess I could put my, put my, <laughs> put my uh, video back on. I'm sorry, I thought I, I had already. And at this point, um, we've got probably 20 minutes left. If there's anybody who'd like to um, either pop something into the chat or turn on the camera and microphone and um, ask questions or make comments, uh, please go ahead. And uh, Malcolm, I'm going to try and find your, your uh, question. And we'll see if I'm Thank more... you. It, it's in the, uh, in the chat. It's, uh, I'm asking about, I tried to download my wife's uh, DNA from Ancestry to, to post it to uh, uh, GEDmatch. And all I got was line after line of data, which was absolutely useless. So I, I was looking for the data, the, download from Ancestry that I can then uh, post to GEDmatch. And basically, how do I get that? That's the question. Okay. Said, Meg's, Meg's got cookies. She tried to share. Yeah, um, the that's, you know, really nice genealogical societies. When I do talks, they send me cookies. <laughs> well, and I belong to another organization called Elder College in Windsor. And we do cookies half at uh, the half time all the way through. And a separate issue at the Durham, my great, my grandfather was Billy Anderson, who had a was a druggist in downtown Newcastle in the nineteen aughts through the nineteen thirties. And uh, uh, one of your uh, one of the historians there did a big uh, genealogy on him, and his father was Dr. William Anderson, who with his wife. Um, Margaret Ellis Seaman is buried in Bond Head Cemetery, and I've been to that cemetery. It's a nice cemetery. I, I, Very nice, I've been yes. down there too. I've got relatives uh, buried there. Well, um, Malcolm, when you go look at the handout, okay, um, the slides for downloading your information from Ancestry are, are in there. So just okay. follow, follow yeah. that. Okay, I'll have to find the handout then. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. Uh, oh. Maybe we can post it again um, in case uh, somebody came in later. Um, yes. The, okay. the, the key is, I think, GEDmatch, I, I know uploading to some of the things, you're not supposed to unzip the file that you get from um, well, Ancestry. I, just, I followed the so-called rules to download from Ancestry and it just, I, I clicked, did the following appropriate clicks. And, uh, finally, when I opened it up, I get this uh, miles and miles of Don't lines. open it. Don't, Don't open it. it. Don't oh, well, open it. But then what was I supposed to do with it once I, I got just, to the point? Just, uh, once you have that file, that's the file that you attach um, when they ask for it in, in when you're in the upload process. You, you just you click not... on the file, and when the file shows up, you say upload. You don't open the file at all. Okay. Um, of course, I'm on a different computer now. I can't see it. I hear what yeah. you're saying. I can go back to that page and uh, go, well, find it again. You know, famous find such things again. I hear you. And uh, I will look for the upload and I'll upload it to GEDmatch. 
yeah, Be it's basically a because my my wife's father was an orphan, and through uh, through lines on ancestry, I found a woman I suspect is his mother, because he told us that his mother was a named Dupuy from Tilbury, Ontario, and so I found a Dupuy, a young woman from Dupuy, from Tilbury, Ontario. Then funny thing also, uh, on the very same page, it says that. Uh, this woman who has this Dupuy girl is also descended from uh, a woman who is my wife's third or fourth great grandmother. So it's quite possible that both my father-in-law, who is descended from this unwed woman named Dupuy, and my mother-in-law is descended from uh, another line because, well, well, the woman, the woman, uh, the woman's from Dupuy is from Tilbury. My mother-in-law is from Florence, Ontario, which is just, just down the highway and around the corner. Yes, and so quite possibly these, you know, you know, they're that that close to each other. They're second cousins. My in-laws may be second or third cousins. Although ancestry says this woman is my wife's either first or second cousin, who actually made the posting to uh, ancestry. Well, if if it if it's that close, it may very well be uh, in that range it could be into the first cousin range too yes well that's quite possible on the dupuy the, the for you know, my father-in-law yeah but, that's that's probably a bit more um a bigger question than what what we really have time to answer here well, i'm not asking that question i'm yeah, just observing yeah. that that's what ancestry said about first yeah. of all my wife and this woman who posted appear to be second well third or fourth cousins on that line but secondly, I found her posting with this Dupuy girl who I had to search because why is this woman my wife's first cousin, first second cousin? Yeah. Because those are two different uh, relationships at two different levels because, you know, back then everyone had who had children, had children, had children. Yes. Who all intermarried. And when you're just down the road and around the corner from each other, your great grandchildren married each other. Thank you very much. I shall go back to that page and I will try and download before I open the page that I told you about. Thank you yeah, very don't much, open Mags. It. Yeah, no, the, raw data, the raw data file is just a jumble of numbers and letters. Yeah, exactly, I hear you. And that's what you, I heard Max say before, and I said, well, maybe, well, I, I now understand, I probably got too far. Thank you for yeah. answering my question. Okay. I appreciate your, your coming back to me. Thank, thank you very yeah. much. And I'm Thanks part of- Thanks for being here, of, Malcolm. Yeah, yeah, and I'm part nice, of, you're nice welcome. You're, and I'm part of, you're welcome, part of Durham because of my, Grandfather William Anderson, the druggist, and his father William Anderson, the dentist or the medical doctor, who's buried in Bondhead, and yeah. that's why I'm part of your Dur this Durham organization. Thank you very much, all. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Rose is asking uh, about the uh, book about the churches, um, and who is the author? Well, the author was. Um, Durham Region Branch and Toronto Branch, I believe, people who went through the um, uh, record books at the United Church Archives and put it put the book together. Uh, the list of churches and the information that's going to be in that book is in the description on Marketplace. So if you go to ogs.on.ca and click on the green button that says marketplace and then digital branch downloads and then Durham region branch, and then church records, uh, you click on that um, Durham region branch uh, United churches and um, the list, I, I copied the whole table of contents into the description. And you can have a quick look through there. It's baptisms, marriages, and some burials. Okay. Um, oh, and Barb and, and Bob Dawes are saying, be very careful with through lines. They're not always correct. And through lines are generated from family trees. And we know some people are excellent researchers and some people are not. So be very careful. Um, the the um the through lines does only pick people out of your match lists so you are related to that person somehow but maybe not through the line through lines that's coming out of the tree fair enough thank you very much i understand okay. 
Here, comment. And I believe I've gone through the chat. So um, we've still got about 10 minutes if someone else wants to uh, come on the microphone and-, and uh... Jacqueline Wilson has her hand up. Oh. Hey, going back to my original question about whether I should upgrade the MT DNA at Family Tree DNA, it was just, is it worth the money? Because I already know that it's not going to do anything for my dad, and I've already done the leads method. Um, but my issue is, should I spend that $119 or whatever it is it costs? Will it do me any good in the long run? If you want to deep, deep dive into your maternal line ancestors, sure. But if you don't want to do that, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I just joined the uh, your group. I got my FT DNA uploaded. Yay. But I don't know what to do next. <laughs> Um, so you, you've, uh, have you uploaded the FT DNA to um, GEDmatch? Is that what you're saying? No, I did a GEDmatch for a very long time. She's uh, got Mito-Y DNA. Oh, yeah. Mito -Y DNA. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Have to, I have to admit, with I've done the full sequence, um, and I haven't come up with anybody. Um, and I've got my maternal, maternal, maternal line back about eight generations and I'm not picking up any matches. So well, at all? It, it's, it's not at all. Nobody. What's I have your no haplogroup? group? Um, T1A1G. Okay, continue. Um, Jacqueline, I, I don't know that it would be helpful for you to do mitochondrial DNA um, for the full sequence. You can't, up, can't upload anything but full sequence to Mito, Mito Y DNA uh, with your uh, Y DNA that you've uploaded. You no, I didn't do any Y DNA because I have no one to do Y DNA. Oh, too bad. Oh, I'm, I'm adopted. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And half of my family is basically British Isles and the other half is Greek and almost no Greeks that are related to me have tested. Yeah, I imagine that the Greeks aren't testing very much. The Italians just started testing and you might have some greek italian because there was lots of vibration right. between those right yeah, i wouldn't do that i wouldn't get the full sequence right now unless you come up with some big mystery you want to try and solve now the mother's happen. side is pretty pretty obvious um there's someone who has taken the family back to the 1600s uh on one side and i'm not I do have a brick wall in 1826, but that's not going to get solved with MT DNA. Yeah. Okay. So I yeah, just wondered if it was worth the extra money. The, have you have you uploaded um, your autosomal to my heritage? Yes, I'm in all five sites. Okay. Oh, good. 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 Yeah, I got a couple group again, Nancy. T what? T one A one G. And I have a T two. A one G. Oh, and your T2. Yeah. Right. But at the least problem, we're, at least that's, we're not why <laughs> that's why I'm wondering why, if I do the full MTDDA, will I take that T2 any further or am I stuck at T2? It is it? Yeah, there's not a lot of people um, that have tested, only 39 people at FTDNA have tested that haplogroup. Um, and there's lots of, there's Netherlands, United States, UK, Scotland, England, and Ireland. So is that T2 or is that T1A1G? That's T1A1G. Check out T2 for uh, Jackie. <clears throat> um, T2. Okay, oh, T2. <clears throat> there is a lot more below T2. Wait. How about T2, T2B4? Wait, okay, Carolyn, one at a time. Good. Yeah. Yeah. T2 is a, a pretty high level haplogroup designation. And there is a lot more that, that happens on down the tree with lots of testers. So eventually, if you want to do some testing uh, with the full sequence, you might find more information. <clears throat> I, I did the full sequence because um, my great uncle was shot down in flames um, in World War One. 
And if they ever find any remnants that could possibly be tested, I'm the person they need. You know, there's, only, a, had there's one, a, only had one sister. There's a group that actually looks for those planes. I, th I think it's called Tiger. You might want to look them up. Okay. So I mean, one. Okay. Um, I have another uh, hand up, Karen Miller, if you would like to uh, unmute and tell us your comment question. <laughs> A question on the uh, Jed match, the pie chart that showed the breakout of origins. I went into Jed match, was trying to find it, and I'm not. I mean, I've got two kits loaded to Jed match, and so I'm on the free part trying right. to find out where you where that Ad, was. Add mixtures, the two there's two different add mixture, those are the ones you're looking for. And if I hit the heritage. There's a drop down of select the project. Right. Uh, what's your, what is your known, um, what's your known heritage? British Mostly Northern Ireland. European, English, Scottish. Okay. I would do the Euro K3. Euro, Euro genes K3? Yeah, Euro genes K3. K13. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. And then, then my other question, since you guys were talking about it, was the Hapla group. Is there an advantage to going to FTDNA, finding my Hapla group, and putting that into GEDmatch? Yeah, if you have your Hapla group from FTDNA, yeah. <clears throat> and Je I, I Jacqueline, you should put your um, Hapla group into GEDmatch and connect your kit number to your GEDmatch information, too. Because I, I had no idea what to do with that. Once yeah, I, I would it. add that. There's a place where you can add that under your profile. Okay. Yeah. Is, is that like the H3AA? Yeah. Is that yours? Yeah. H3. Well, I've got this page comes up starting with H and then it comes down to five lines of H3AA and five lines of HT152C exclamation. I don't, I don't know what that means. I really so don't know what any of this There are 156 testers, Scotland, Honduras, Germany, England, Ireland, and the United States. The Honduras is probably an outlier of somebody who has Irish, German, and English, and Scottish heritage that just lives in Honduras and reported that as their origins. Okay. But it's the H3AA that I should pick up and transfer to GenMatch. Yeah, I think so. I, I haven't seen your results, yeah. so I can't tell you specifically. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. I took the test and I never have studied about what to do with it. <laughs> well, the basically, it's just putting in your Hapla group. And then if someone does match to you somehow and sees you have the same Hapla group as you, they can, um, they can wow. guess that okay. you're related on maternal lines. And, and Karen, the, the H3AA uh, mutated at 1700 BCE. Oh, <laughs> is that, that's a little while ago. Is yeah, 3,700 years ago. That long ago, okay. 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 I forget which kit or which site has that little map thing that shows out of Africa. Yeah, um, I'm looking at that now. It's, um, here, let me share my screen. That was a really cool. Oh, good, good. <laughs> yes, please do. So this is, um, this is uh, Scaled Innovations, SNP Tracker. And I was looking at two different things. Um, here's the Tree Explorer. So H3AA is the very bottom of that line for now <laughs> until other people test. And this is where I was getting those uh, percentages. And this is how it goes back up the mitochondrial tree to wow. mitochondrial. Well, it's, this is not mitochondrial Eve. It's actually a uh, archeological specimen that they have found that is the reference se sequence that we compare everything to. I think they're gonna be correcting that when they come out with the Million Mito Project. And then I was also looking at the SNP distance. And this is again that reference sequence from that uh, archeological reference. And this, it comes down to this and let's go to the map. Here you go. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And it shows you uh, 
north, uh, maybe Yorkshire. Yeah, my, who knows? Yeah. H, the H haplogroups are 47% of everybody living today. Ah. So it's kind of like RM269 and H. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop Thank my you. share. And go back to talking. Okay. Well, I would like to say thank you to everybody. That was kind of fun to have a little chat at the end. And um, we are at our two hour limit. So I would like to say thanks again for attending. And it was great. And Yay. we'll see you in September. I if can. you don't come to the DNA or the library drop-ins. Um, but we do have the library drop-ins through the summer and the research room is open through the summer and fall. So come and join us if you're in the local area. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.